Instructional Designers and in Offices Drinking Coffee is brought to you by Domino, makers of Domino One, the cloud-based authoring tool for e-learning. Learn how your team can work together better at domino.com. Now, here's this week's episode. Oh, there we go. Ta-da! <laughs> The coffee has finally started to kick in. going to be shocked when I say that it is sunny and warm in Arizona. Weird. <laughs> How long is that going to last, Brent? Uh, at least another, uh, you know, 11 <laughs> months. <laughs> <laughs> those, those weather patterns, eh? Like crazy. Yeah. It is also beautiful and sunny here um, in eastern Ontario and Ottawa, um, which is awesome. First day, first official day of summer, the 21st of June and all that. Um, the solstice, right? How many folks in the chat were up at this morning, uh, you know, uh, capturing the sunrise to honor the, the solstice. solstice? Well, we got no druids in the audience today. Come on, <laughs> what, what are you doing? <laughs> but we got weather reports coming in from all over the place. Welcome, everybody, in the chat. Thanks for joining us on another amazing Wednesday morning. Chris, we got a guest. We do indeed, folks. We have Mike Ruska joining us here today. Mike, I, I said to Brent, we've had Mike on before, and Brent said, no. And I said, what? Um, know, so introduce happened? yourself to uh, to the folks who, uh, who are joining us here today in the chat. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Great. I love anything that starts with dancing. So, you know, <laughs> you, you guys know how to do it. Dancing and coffee make the world go round. Uh, I'm here in Pennsylvania. Um, I, I love technology. I've been fascinated with technology since I've been a kid and studying, you know, the history of technology and trying to forecast technology. Um, I spent four years at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland, trying to study large scale systems change and uh, technology and left there and uh, founded a company in 2004 and have been helping to really accelerate things at that intersection between learning, education, tech, and and uh, technology. Uh, because there's so much that we could do, but there's so many suboptimal outcomes. You know, one story of inspiration, I was in the music industry and a little break from college. And when I went back, they said, we, we want to launch these distance learning classrooms at uh, the Pitt campuses. We want to connect professors and students. And it'll be amazing. And so we did the design and hired all the people and set everything up. And uh, all it was, was bad television. The professors <laughs> talked the same way. And like, it was crazy because actually <clears throat> certain, certain students, groups would tip me or the operators to leave the camera or to leave the uh, system on mute so they could go like this and have some back channel conversation. It was like a suboptimal implementation. 1998, I said, this intersection between you know, learning, education, and training and technology, I want to focus there because it could be so much more awesome. We took a blackboard, we turned into a whiteboard. We took a whiteboard, we turned into a smart board. I, we could do better. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, suboptimal. Ah, yep, that's probably a good description for an awful lot of our space sometimes, yep. Um, and today, though, we are talking, we have an official topic, um, adaptive learning organizations, which is, ooh, that's interesting. What do you mean by that, Mike? I mean, so so think about the organization really uh, with ecosystems thinking, you know, we, the connective collaboration, the connective tissue, and a really good organism is able to sense and augment and adapt in some ways. And so should an organization. And when you think about it, organizations do this well in their marketing and their competitive intelligence and uh, search engine optimization. But as far as really deeply understanding employee needs, the employee experience, um, and forecasting and meeting emerging demand in the organization, it's much more challenged. I mean, how many organizations do some type of pulse for the employee experience? And that happens 
maybe once a year or something. Mm -hmm. And then there's informal data that's gathered. But if you think about it, an organization that's able to sense, respond, and adapt continuously to a range of conditions, both internally and externally. And so I think these types of organizations are the best types of organizations to, to aspire to be. And this is this combines a range of thinking. And technology isn't the answer. It's just one component of these types of organizations. Very cool. And, you know, I know, Claire, I know you're on the chat. And uh, so maybe you could throw in, I've got some HR.com articles um, as we're as we're going through some of this stuff. There's some references that you guys can kind of take and dig in, double click on. And also design thinking tools. We, we love design thinking because designs thinking, systems thinking, that's how you situate technology um, well inside an organization so that you don't get suboptimal outcomes, <laughs> as, as, as we might say many times throughout this. And if you <laughs> want to optimize or actualize what it is you're trying to do, those are great tools. And so, you know, the things that we, the concepts we have, we try to define and design some design thinking tools to help other people uh, employ those concepts, read the article, start working, make your adaptive learning organization. And, and get cool. it done. We we got we've got ten principles we kind of want to get through, and I'm all of a sudden thinking to myself, we may not have enough time to get through all of them, and we should probably just kind of uh, well jump into that first of all, but then also maybe help folks kind of understand, uh, you know, how all of these different elements play together, and and really like like tactically. What can some of the folks do that are listening today? How, how can they apply this stuff? So if we can kind of, you know, focus on that a little bit, what is, we'll start at the first one, putting people first. It seems kind of obvious, but I'm guessing no. I mean, it, it is right. We put people first when we say we need new people at the organization. Let's recruit, let's recruit people, um, you know, and, and let's onboard them. And that's where things start to get precarious. You know, onboarding is, uh, onboarding today is different than it used to be. You know, in many organizations, uh, onboarding is a virtual experience today. One big Silicon Valley company used to fly all of their new engineers to San Francisco for a week when you're onboarded. And every week they had a cohort and 20 to 80 people would show up and they'd play games and ride scooters and do all this fun stuff. When the pandemic hit, they said, that's oh, okay. Let's just move to WebEx. You can't simulate those same experiences, you know, that you way. You can't so, ride scooters on in a WebEx? <laughs> I, I don't know, but I would like to go segue jousting with you sometime, Brent. I, think, I okay. think that would be just a fun thing, but we can sidebar on that later. Okay. Um, but but that uh, would be man. a fun onboarding experience. It'd be memorable and meaningful and motivational as well. But, you know, the idea of putting people first. Yeah, we think about putting people first in terms of getting them here, interested and, and onboarded. But do people, you know, if we reached out, you know, the best consultant in the world for a 10,000 person company would just go and talk to every person of the 10,000 person company. But that's not realistic in, you know, in terms of time and space. So we, if we wanted to talk to everyone, if we went to everyone in the 10,000 person company, I said, do you feel like you're consistently challenged at the right level? Do you feel like you know what the next step is in your personal development? Do you feel like you know what horizontal or vertical mobility looks like? Do you know what to do? Do you feel like you have the time to do those things? Probably the answer wouldn't be yes to all of those things. Yeah. And so when we put people first, we really design our entire uh, system from systems thinking and, and from our um, technology situation to really support people along that continuum of development. You know, the metaphor I like to use is think about climbing Everest. First, you get first you get to get up there and you got big glaciers and they have the ladders strapped together and nobody wants to fall over that. That's what onboarding is like. There's a big crevasse and you're entering a new territory and then you got to trek through. And, and now as you move through the organization, you're going from base camp to base camp. Well, it's kind of defined in terms of the landscape and it's very clear. You have clear line of sight on where the top of Everest is, uh, unless it's really foggy. But, you know, many organizations might have fog in them. You don't know where base camp is, but, you know, it's generally not that way. Maybe it's this way and you're kind of hopeful. But putting people first makes it abundantly clear about the pathways uh, for development. That's the end user. Uh, you know, the other side of that is, and I talk about this a little later with the value perception of L&D is, but everybody has to value what everyone else brings to the table in terms of people development. You know, if everyone in an organization, if they, you think they might not know something and the organization seeks answers, where might they find those answers? Well, it would be great if every time the organization wanted to learn something, they called the L&D folks and said, <laughs> We don't know enough about artificial intelligence and augmented enterprises. Can you help us get smart? I don't need an e-learning course. I need a brief or a dossier or something like that. 
help me get smart. So valuing people and what their contributions can be to that overall concept of an adaptive learning organization. Mm -hmm. Nice. We, you've already kind of mentioned the term ecosystems thinking, but maybe just summarize that up real quick. And how does that connect with the people part? Yeah. So it, everyone, you can imagine a good ecosystem. It could be a rainforest you know, it, it could be a reef. Um, it, it could be a desert. Um, each of those things has its own um, base flora and fauna and species that interact together. Um, and they are, they're all dependent on each other. You know, if, if you kill the wrong species, you can destroy the ecosystem. Adding in an apex predator changes things. So when you start to think about what your organization is, what the organizational units are, um, and how you're connected to the outside sort of broader ecosystem, really thinking about ecosystems and dependencies and that sort of connective tissue uh, between things is, is really critical. We could spend a lot of time on this one. So <laughs> right. I, 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 well, I, I was I'll, just going to say, yeah, the, the, the connective collaboration, you just kind of mentioned how it's all connected and collaborating in that connected ecosystem. That's the third one. And so it's pretty easily slides into that one, right? Or is there something different there? No, absolutely. So if you're, if everyone is saying, People are the number one thing. It's not buildings. It's not technology. It's the buildings and technology and programs and other things are used to develop people. And those are tools that we use connected in ecosystems. You think about connective collaboration. Um, so, you know, how strong is the relationship between L&D and IT? How strong is the relationship between L&D and the CFO? It's that connective collaboration that helps to unpack ideas for how might L&D take this business vector or this hopeful outcome or this metric and move it in some way. So it's that collaboration between different elements of the ecosystem, that symbiotic relationship, the lamprey on the shark, you know, maybe they can swim faster, whatever that, you know, I'm sure there's a better reef metaphor than that one. I've always loved the symbiotic relationship phrase. I don't know why. Well, I mean, it's an all, it's an all win situation. I, I'm talking with, with a, a learning leader of, you know, of a large organization and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in their organization related to artificial intelligence, but they don't have a seat at the table. But they're probably the number one stakeholder that could take the knowledge flows that could come out of large language models and make those flows appropriately right-sized and dripped into the right learning loops you know, inside of their organization. So it's really thinking in ecosystems and having that cross-functional collaboration and not just, hey, we know each other. No, hey, I'm a valued partner for that person. They're a valued partner for me. We see together the same things related to moving KPIs and moving metrics and putting people first along the way. Yeah, it's a, a kind of a common theme in a lot of our conversations here in Idiotic, that idea of the L&D team moving from being order takers, we need a course on, to being actual, you know, business partners being seen as part of the, you know, the planning processes early on, et cetera, rather than just being a reactive agency or a reactive group as well, too. Completely agree. And, and so, you know, in, in an ideal situation, it would look like this, you know, Chris, you're in L&D and I say, Chris, look, the, you know, this revenue per employee is really challenging as the CFO. I really need your help because I don't know exactly what can be done. And I want an ideation partner to think through these types of things. That's the phone call that you mm -hmm. want to be getting. And exactly. Yep. Just a thinking partner with your business partners. And also to say, hey, look, we don't know the answer, but let me go and benchmark with my peers because no one is as promiscuous as a collaborator as people in L&D. <laughs> and we share like crazy. We love to share stories. We love to help others. And so I think that's fantastic. And no yeah. one that I know generally says no. They just say, I might not be able to tell you everything, but I could tell you at least a little bit of something about how we solved that problem. Yeah, very cool. Yep. Yeah, I noticed Kevin in the chat said, uh, it, it, this was back when we were talking about things can be so much better. He says, and we're still saying it could be so much better. <laughs> And well, it just reminded me of our last conversation with Cami Bean saying, you know, that, uh, you know, Brent, uh, it, things have changed, but yet nothing really has changed <laughs> in our industry and in general. And I, I, so I, that's why I, I when when she mentioned that, it was funny because I, I started thinking I, I was looking forward to this conversation mm -hmm. because how do we. How do we move that needle? We first have to see where it is that we're going. Like, what is it that we want to become? And it, I was thinking in the back of my mind, this adaptive learning organization, I think is really 
that space that we need to be getting into. And, and we don't have to go through all of these in the list in order. If anybody in the chat sees one that they want us to jump into and that you're you're not quite sure how it fits in or you want to hear Mike's perspective on it, just drop it into the chat. And oh, that's yeah, go ahead. No, that, that's great. You know, here you're going to get a little bit of help. You know, the, the joke at NIST was, um, what's the great thing about standards? And the nerdy answer is, we have so many to choose from. So, <laughs> I, so in thinking about purpose-driven design, right, every organization is the same in some way, and every organization is different in some ways. And while you might have, you know, KPIs and measurement frameworks, uh, I, I like metrology. Let me make that understood very quickly. Measures and metrics matter. Um, and so purpose-driven design is, you know, critically important. You've got some guiding uh, support that's out there. Um, first is ISO 30414. Uh, that is an ISO standard on human capital metrics. They've identified 57 uh, human capital metrics across the landscape that could be applied to large, medium, and small businesses. So that's a starting point. If you're thinking about purpose, obviously, we want people to be put first, but it has to matter for the business in a meaningful way. If you're going to get the investment and you're going to get the, the O&M and sustainment dollars um, associated with it. But, so ISO 30414 is super helpful. I have Claire. never heard of that. That's like, that is a flash for me. Chris, have you ever known there was an ISO standard for that? Uh, no. And my fingers were just going over to the mouse to start Googling that. So Claire, <laughs> will, Claire, will you throw it, will you throw it in the chat so that the people can kind of grab onto it? Yeah. So the question is, Holy crap, there's 57 metrics in there. Do I need to use them all? No, yeah, that was my, you, that was my other don't. reaction. You know, <laughs> seven. You you might think about like almost like a crawl walk run in the future, and so here here is what this gives you. This gives you the opportunity in L and D to open up a conversation with the CFO and, and the C suite to say these things matter for this business. We are the ones that impact this business. We don't impact it solely. We impact it in working together with you. We can move these needles, and so that's a really fantastic um, starting point to look at and also something to open up the conversation. There's also ISO 30437 for human resource development, which is the new learning and development metrics. The standard is just about to be released. So that's ISO 30437. It's going to cost you 150 bucks, but I think it'll be worth it because you're paying ISO to keep making standards. And also, um, <laughs> and, and also it has 52 metrics related to L&D. So while you might have metrics that your organization thinks are critical to your business and general to business, now you have 109 additional things that you might pull out of a bag and start a conversation with your organization to yeah. say, hey, should we look at training dollars per employee or revenue per employee? If we move this needle, how does this affect this needle? Um, in, in some ways. And so the, here's the here's the hard thing about this. The things that are easiest to measure aren't worth knowing all that much <laughs> to change the world. So I can go hop over on the scale in the bathroom nine feet away and it will tell me a number. And it's super easy for me to get on the scale. That does not tell me how to fix it. I got to know how much food I put in my face and how much activity I get, which I can get this a little easier, but tracking what goes in here and what it is and how much of it that's a little bit harder, but those two things in concert really tell me exactly how to correct that. So there's the idea of leading and lagging uh, indicators. So finance and finance metrics are always a good lagging indicator. They're, they're the best uh, lagging indicator, but they don't tell you anything to fix it. Yeah. You know, I was just going to say too, I mean, I think that, I, that the ISO thing just is like a, just that's a mind blown part because we always tell folks you need to go speak to these other leaders and you need to speak in their language you know, and, but I've never really had like the official standard stuff, right? Well, I just assumed we would just kind of make up our own, but instead of going and talking to them using our L and D language that most of them roll their eyes at, you know, having those working with official standards, I don't know if that feels like talking to those, or at least a few of them that apply would kind of level up that perception of L and D and speaking of the perception of L and D, Jill uh, asked to hear more about the valued perception of L&D, which is in the second column there. Yeah, well, super. Well, I mean, I touched on this, uh, you know, a little bit earlier, you know, in an ideal situation when Brent's the CEO and he says, I don't know enough about blank. He should call learning. He should be calling me and say, hey, it's cool. I got an analyst on that. 
uh, we'll get you a brief, sir, within 24 hours. Like that needs to happen all of the time. It, if you're going to have an ad adaptive learning organization, LND needs to be thought of as a value creation center and not a cost center, which, which it typically is. And the only way that you're going to be able to frame to come back to what we're just talking about, that as a value creation center is to have very clear metrics that are agreed upon with the business that you're co-investing your resources with their with their resources to drive those outcomes in a very measured way and as long as you're directionally correct you're going to be upping that relationship um, and upping the perception of l d as a, as a valuable business partner that drives metrics that matter right so oh smile sheets c level mm -hmm. doesn't give a crap about the smile sheets they don't care and they don't even care how many people go through the training what they care about are things like revenue per employee, training costs per employee, and the relationships of those. And so you know, measures and metrics. So we can measure you know, something, but a metric is a combination of two or more measures. And so that's where we really get something that's interesting. So you know, as an example, if uh, to get on the valued perception piece, if someone came to us and said, hey, guys, it's just taken way too long to onboard people. And we said, all right, we got a plan for that. And we just crank out our new intervention and we onboard people at a super fast rate and say, look, we did a great job. And they say, yeah, but our attrition rate uh, in six months went from 15% to 62%. Oh, we, we were using the wrong measuring stick. Oops. We needed to use a ratio between those two measures to understand that relationship, to ensure that we weren't toting the seesaw too far to one side in some ways. And so that's a trap, right? And so if we're going to get a valued perception of L&D, we're going to start with standard measures that we agree upon with the business. We're going to align with the business strategy, but we're going to be the ideators. We're going to be the, the thought partners and the co-creators of what those interventions are in, in a super collaborative way with the business. That's how you up the value perception. It's not by going and saying, we're really important. You should do stuff for us. That just <laughs> doesn't work. You're not going to get there. I love it. And so many of these things are... Uh... That, that valued perception of L&D, some of the other principles really are ways to improve that. Uh, you know, things like uh, purpose-driven design, collective collaboration, and even, um, and I like the phrasing on this one, problem seeking. We tend to think of problem solving, but uh, but here we're saying, what, are we going out and looking for trouble here? Yeah, we're going out to pick a fight. <laughs> I mean, that, that's really what it is. And so, <laughs> When you have some kind of agreed upon framework for measurement and you start to measure things and you don't have directionally correct indicators, that's the first problem. When you have directionally correct indicators when you're looking at data, um, but they're not moving fast enough, that's the second set of problems for an organization. But And through ecosystems thinking and connective collaboration, you will find problems. <laughs> and, you know, problems yeah. comes from depending upon the way you look at pro and blamos, meaning something thrown in front of us. And you hear people, it's evidenced in the language, say things like, we'll get out of this, we'll get over this, we'll get through this. But they're really talking about an obstacle and that obstacle stands between them and the outcome that they're seeking. So, you know, there's a whole set of questions you can ask about a problem uh, to try to articulate it because people are really good at reporting problems. People are really generally bad at articulating the problem. And if you can articulate a problem well enough, much like a donut, the solution will appear in the middle of that. And Claire, I'll give you a mission here. If you can find the problem articulation tool, I think it's bit.ly slash problem tool. There's a hundred questions tool uh, that we put together. We use this in, in our practice that mm -hmm. you can use to articulate a problem once you found someone to report one or once you get Scooby-Doo in the van out there and mystery machine and try to find them. I love it. I love it. Yeah. In, in that model, the problem is always the janitor just wearing a costume. <laughs> you got to pull the rubber mask off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Those meddling kids. I yeah. mean, L&D department. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, so, it, you know, I think that would be a really fun sort of mantra. Either the Scooby-Doo van or the A-team van, because you yeah. want to be seen as the A-team. You're the people that come in, special forces, build the <laughs> contraption, blow up the thing, and then to teach the villagers how to survive after you're there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, as we were talking in the green room, I would suggest that a lot of L&D teams end up feeling more like MacGyver, always having to put things together with, you know, bubble gum, extra wire, and, a, um, and maybe a, a pocket knife. So, 
Well, the MacGyver School of Engineering motto is improvise or die. So, mm -hmm. and there's a great MacGyver School of Engineering t-shirt that's out there. Um, Quick, find that link for us, Claire. <laughs> yeah, Claire, we need the MacGyver School of Engineering t-shirt. It's amazing. Yeah, so, uh, hey, we're at, we're at the bottom of the hour. It doesn't mean that we're wrapping up or anything. We still have plenty of time, but I... I, I just really wanted to talk about uh, it, how does AI fit into all of this? And I don't know how long of a conversation that is, but just kind of wanted to squeeze that in since it's such a hot topic. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So uh, our, our chief scientist is uh, Dr. Dennis Folds. He was uh, chief scientist at Georgia Tech Research Institute for seven years and there for 35 years. And when we first started working together, he said, there is no such thing as artificial intelligence. And I said, I, I, what? I don't understand. You know, you've been studying this stuff for years. And he said, no such thing as artificial intelligence. It's just really good software. All right. So we argued for a couple months and eventually did agree with him that the idea of artificial intelligence is a design tenant. It's an aspiration for just really good software. So while we have a ton of hype around AI and I love AI and we're doing a ton of stuff with AI, uh, it's just a technology. And if you want to be thoughtful about that, you need to think about how that fits into a functional node inside of your enterprise, not just at an individual contributor level, because we could say, all right, a person in L&D, you could go out and use ChatGPT and say, this is my business. I'm an instructional designer. This is what I want to do. L learn colon, which is a really cool prompt. And you could share with it, maybe a competency model or some content and get it to get in context with you. And then you could use it to generate learning objectives and assessments and questions. So a lot of the sort of backgrounding that you might do could be accelerated, but that's just, you know, that's just in that role in some ways. And then obviously way too much of a topic to cover here, but what about your stuff being out there in the public? And so like the organizations that I'm working with on AI stuff, we're doing things with ChatGPT, but we also have small privately hosted language models where the content associated with the company is safe and secure in there. And then we do some checking with ChatGPT that doesn't um, reveal any of the proprietary information uh, for the companies. But that's just like an instructional designer working with a corpus. And I think for L&D, like this is probably the most exciting time. If you're able to get a model that has the knowledge in your organization with clean data and you're able to consistently add to that model, that model is the key for you know unlocking the two patterns in an organization, which are knowledge flows and learning loops. New knowledge gets created from the right things and emergence in an organization. It's L&D's job to find out where new knowledge is created. It's L&D's job to figure out where learning loops need to be for whom in that organization. And as an organization accelerates its op tempo, of movement in, into the future. And we know the tempo of every company is increasing at an increasing rate with the jerk factor win in technology. Uh, mm -hmm. You've gotta be able to respond, but you might think further up an organization. You might have a team, Chris and Brent and I, we need to design ex a day long experiential learning event. Well, we could have a thought partner, our fourth guy over here, that's our AI that we're doing this with. I recently was working with uh, Brandon Carson on some concept for a podcast. 42 minutes, we designed 12 episodes of the podcast. We figured out all the guests, we wrote all the questions, we did all the stuff, but that was him and I thinking with ChatGPT, you know, as, as a thought partner without proprietary data. You might think at higher level of an organization, there's a department or a business unit that's using AI to focus their time and attention on certain things or certain metrics. You might think at the exec level, you might think at the board level. So there's a, a self-similar sort of scale independent way that AI as a technology can be put into an organization, which is what I call the augmented enterprise. And really the, the key where I think the most juice can be squeezed out of this is augmented intelligence teams. So three of us, we got to design the experiential learning thing or or yeah. you know, Brent, you're, you're the CFO and um, Chris, you're the CEO and I'm the L&D person. Let's think together about what this metric is and let's let's work with what public information is and then let's interrogate our private model and be able to synthesize that data. And then the future thing, which is a whole topic in itself is, what happens when AI is helping our organization and our supply chain and our partners and others be more highly more efficient um, in, in terms of our connective collaboration at that scale? I haven't, I've seen a lot of people um, put up fun samples of chat GPT, but it's always around instruct traditional instructional design stuff. Like help me come up with objectives, help me write multiple choice questions. But you know what, you know what I have not seen anybody do yet to your point 
is I haven't seen anybody ask chat GPT, what are the metrics I should be measuring for if I'm going to be training on X, Y, Z problem or whatever, or, or Hey, chat GPT, I've been asked to create training on X, Y, Z. Do you think it's actually a training problem? Like at, and asking <laughs> those questions, right. And seeing what chat GPT says. Cause I think that's, those are the super interesting questions that need to be asked. Cause you know, it's, it's kind of a cute parlor trick to let chat GPT give you your instructional objectives for very specific things and all that kind of stuff. But the stuff that we do as instructional designers before we even get to that part, I think is where it might get really interesting, but I have yet to see, I mean, I'm sure people have done it, but uh, it, it's not touted as highly <laughs> or, uh, or reshared on social media as much, or at least I haven't seen it. So that's interesting. So you can think about the, we know, we think this is a learning problem, design the learning, but above that layer, there's the sort of uh, management or what I would call the management consulting stuff. So, you know, um, Dr. Michael Allen has written all kinds of great books on e-learning design. We trained a book, we trained a bot on all of Dr. Allen's methods and principles. And that bot asks you questions and helps you design the learning stuff. And it's, it's really fascinating. On top of that though, we said, well, what, what does a big management, I almost mentioned a name, what would a big management consulting firm uh, do? Well, they'll send a whole team of people into your business and they'll interview a bunch of people and they'll ask you who your competitors are. And, you know, then they'll, then they'll try to figure out how to differentiate you. And, you know, we might have 12 people for like six months there till you get maybe a little bit of a vision and a roadmap um, in some ways. And, and so that's cool. That's helpful, but that's not fast and uh, that's not inexpensive either. So we, we have a trained bot that um, uses open models as well as private models. And what this bot does, so um, we'll load up a, a, a fictional store from my, my favorite um, series of movies, S-Smart. Remember the series Evil Dead? That was, that, wow. that, uh, some people might know that's like funky pop culture. So S-Smart, <laughs> you know, they're, they're a big box retail store. They, they want to beat the big box retail store that keeps coming across the street from them, you know, based upon their location. So what this bot does with some backgrounding, a few hours of data and, um, you know, a little bit of training over, over a short period of time, depending on the size of their corpus, says, oh, that's the competitor you want to kill? These are the KPIs that uh, you should differentiate from them on that will help you uh, sort of move your needles in your business. Here's the prioritization of those KPIs. Here are the metrics to drive those KPIs based upon the competencies and roles in your organization. These are the people that should be involved. This is the scaffolded competency model above your current competency model. Here's a bunch of different ranges of personas that could be used to design experiential role-playing games that would then use BJ Fogg's persuasive technology work from Stanford's uh, uh, Persuasive Technology Institute. Oh, by the way, here's all the plots for all the games. Here's all the variations for the games. And um, here's the user stories to go into JIRA. And here's all the experience API code to wire together. So that's the kind of tools that we're using to accelerate, right? So it's that not just a lot right there. <laughs> You're going the full stack of what's the needle we want to move and how do we move that needle from the top to the bottom as fast as humanly possible. AFAHP. Man. Yeah, again, it's, mind blown. It's, it's kind of magic, right? And so that's, <laughs> that's a couple analysts and a tool in like a very short period of time. And it's an order of magnitude less cost than and an order of magnitude greater output. So it's a 100x difference. Hmm. Yes, this is like the best time to be alive to play with these things. <laughs> oh, some, people say, some people say, you know, like chat GPT and these language models are like interns. But when you have something that you know how to load the context on and you can do the right fine tuning training or embeddings, it's like 20 employees in a box. And that's great because if you're a small L&D organization and you can adopt yeah. and adapt to some of these things and start to build out that valued relationship uh, with the business, you're in a great position uh, to change the business at, and have you know 10 times the output value for the organization then you're getting your valued perception of L and D. Yeah. I, I can't tell Sam if you're a skeptic with that comment in the chat or if, uh, <laughs> or if you're, or if you're all in on it, but it's darn good to see you in the chat, Sam. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I mean, that is, um, that is huge. I, my mind is blown. Chris, what, what do you got? What, what, yeah, it certainly makes the, um, 
the, the things that we see most commonly uh, feel very in, in social media shares, et cetera, but AI makes them feel very unrepresentative uh, of the potential for sure. Mm. Just parlor tricks, right? Just like little, it's like, you know, we're making chat GPT do like the easy work. It's almost like if you ask chat GPT, they'd say, seriously, like, like it should answer back. Really? You want me to write objectives? I could, I, I <laughs> should be answering such bigger questions. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like the L and D team saying, "Seriously, you want a training course?" <laughs> right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no That's kidding. the one thing that ChatGPT um, does not get judgmental, I guess, unless you ask it to. We we got a few minutes left here. Are there are there any key of uh, you know of the ten principles that we should also still touch on mm, or, or yeah circle back to, Mike? Well, I mean, there's probably there's probably one or two. I think that, that just to reiterate it, technology mm -hmm. isn't the answer. Technology mm -hmm. is a component doing all of these other things and then finding purpose, you know, for technology, much in the distance learning thing I talked about earlier is like, yeah, we got all the technology in place and people running the technology, but the professors taught the same way, didn't engage with the students. The students became actively disengaged, you know, in that way. That was not putting people first. That was putting technology first, you know in that instance. And so I think everyone becomes enamored with, and I've heard many leaders at organizations say, well, just solve that problem, just buy what we need. And that that doesn't mean rolling it out. And, you know, I've heard some different stats, but let's just say for every dollar you spend on technology, you're going to spend more than you spend on that in figuring out how to situate it and instantiate it in the organization and continually improve it along the way. Hmm. Yeah. It Fantastic point. So as uh, was there, was there more you wanted to touch on Chris? What did, what else did you see? Well, I, I just keep coming back to the, the list of these 10 principles and it almost feels if we were focused on the valued perception of L and D that this could be almost a bullet list, right? Where the opening statement is how to create a valued perception of L and D and all of these other things are, 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 are connected steps then, uh, you know, to, to, to drive you, yourself towards that in a sense. So. I agree, Chris, 100%. Um, th this is kind of like the Easter egg that's in here. Really, the, the, the top level of the slide for your own, for your own purposes should be how to, how to become the rock star at your organization. Um, and then these are the things underneath of that. What this is, is a framework for having that conversation with the, the C-suite team to say, mm. you know, we want to be the go-to. When you have a problem, we want to be there because we like you want to put people first. We think in ecosystems, we think about data and we think and we're going to seek problems, but we need a partnership with you. If we're, if we're going to do this, if we're going to double down on developing people. We want to do it. We want to do it in a measured way. Uh, we want to we want to really focus on the outcomes for the business. And we we're going to really focus on those leading measures along that journey. How, um, before we do get too close to wrapping it up, give us a, do you have a short story that you could tell us about somebody that's been successful in making this happen from an L&D department and, and making that shift? Um, so they're all, early, they're all early on in different phases. You know, I, I generally think crawl, walk, run, fly. And I like to tell stories about things that are flying uh, in some ways, but I'll, I'll just give you like just a, a kind of a couple of pieces, Lar large uh, Silicon Valley tech company, lots of standard operating procedures, lots of things that mean something out there publicly, if you'd ask ChatGPT, but mean something privately when you ask, you know, their model um, taken and, and eaten all of their SOPs um, in, into a model so that when you ask those things, and it's a private model. When you ask those things that you might like, what is this acronym or how does this work? Not only does it give you the information, it gives you secondary information to be able to dig further into. And it also gives you authoritative sor sources from the corpus of the company. And I think that that's a really important design pattern. I don't just want the information. I want to be able to go to the next level uh, of information. So when I was at NIST, my boss was great. If I'd say, Pete, I have an idea, he'd say eight seconds. That's all I got. And then if I said something valuable, Cool. Otherwise, he'd say, come back when you know what you're talking about. And so and if you think <laughs> about that, I just need eight seconds of what the information is. But then I need to be able to dig deeper into that. You know, you might think commercial trailer 
documentary, full feature film, you know, if you think about the, the grain size or the fidelity of information. But I think having authoritative sources was a really good innovation in that. Have a, another thing we're doing with training language models for some uh, best selling authors. Um, and so imagine you're an author and you want to write another book, but you know, you might have used a ghostwriter before, think about using a ghostwriter. But what if you had you? What if you had all of your writings and maybe all of the books, the authors that you really like and their writing styles and other other content inside of that corpus that you could interact with? That would be kind of fun. And so really cool. we're doing a bunch of this stuff in uh, in uh, the DoD portfolio, training metahumans with behaviors and all kinds of things. And that stuff I can't share too much about, but I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I, I will give you a disclaimer. This is not PG rated. It's not X, but it's not PG. So um, because we're training bots that are able to talk about certain things that won't talk about certain things that have certain personalities or a combination of personalities. Well, on one of our hack days, uh, the team built this. I just put it in the uh, chat, Mr. GPT. So Mr. GPT is a motivational um, bot. Uh, Mr. GPT is trained as Mr. T, Samuel L. Jackson, David Goggins, um, and a, a Marine Corps drill instructor. And so if you, and I use Mr. GPT, every morning i pick one thing that i want to focus on for the day and uh, mr gpt like i said is not for the faint of heart he will use profanity with you um however uh he will get you motivated very quickly don't be alarmed he's he's not in like full enterprise mode um but <laughs> when you type what you want to do like i want to exercise more i want to lose weight i want to rock that meeting at you know three o'clock whatever uh, you'll see clubber lang training in the rocky scene and then then the text will come out and um this is an example of that behavioral type of training. And if you ask him for stock advice or like what restaurant to eat at, God bless you. Cause he's going to haze you because <laughs> he won't talk about that stuff. He wants to motivate you to do good things. <laughs> oh my gosh. It, far too many things for us to talk about in uh, 45 minutes. So we have to wrap it up, Mike, but thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, absolutely fascinating conversation, um, and, and thanks so much for bringing it to us and, and, and sharing this whole uh, this whole framework today. Um, lots of, as always, great conversation in the chat. Um, as Brent is about to push the the music button, I will mention, as we always do, that what we get to do here on instructional designers in offices, uh, drinking coffee or other beverages, depending on where your five o'clock is, um, it's all sponsored by Domino, and so. We do offer some some things that we feel can help people in our recovery space. So throw a link into the chat there. Check that out. Indeed, we also have a uh, LinkedIn group that you can join. I'll go ahead and drop that in there and wow. hang out with us. Very cool. So, as always, tons of fun. Yeah, it's so great to see so many people and actually folks that I have not seen in a while. So you regulars, thanks for showing up. Again, Mike. Awesome. Great stuff. I have to hit one of the other four slides. <laughs> and with that, we'll just go ahead and drink some coffee.